Hello everybody, my name is Richard Smith, I'm the director of the Tank Museum here in Bovington and today I'm going to do another bottom five tanks because slating other people's work is quite cathartic. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos and I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Those of you who are regular viewers of our YouTube channel here at the Tank Museum will know I've already done a bottom five tanks, but much like the top five tanks, there's no upper limit to the number of bottom five tanks you can pick if you want to go and berate other people's work. The, the key thing in all of these is picking your criteria and then matching stuff to it. And in my first bottom five tanks that I did, the criteria I picked there were looking at vehicles for which there was a, a fundamental design problem, but they still went in production and ended up on the battlefield. Today, I'm gonna to look at something a bit different. So picture this, this scenario is what I'm gonna to base today's bottom five on. For those of you who worked uh, in the corporate world in the past like I have, this will be distressingly familiar. You arrive in the office in the morning and you're told you have to go to a seminar. And you go into your seminar in a meeting room with your cup of coffee and you see there's a management consultant and he's standing in front of a whiteboard and has a great big stack of coloured post-it notes. And he opens up his brainstorming session with the phrase, there's no such thing as a bad idea. And as you listen to the gentle thud of heads on desks, you recognise the fact you're going to have to write off the rest of your morning. And the key problem here is he's just said something that is blatantly untrue, but you at that particular moment are not armed with a way of proving him wrong. Well today, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to arm you with the arguments you need in that scenario, and I'm going to equip you through the medium of tanks. Now, of course, the best example of proving that sometimes there really is such a thing as a stupid idea is not a tank, but is, I give you, the Russell Boomerang Grenade. Let's just ponder this for a second. Yes, a boomerang grenade. There are a number of issues you could probably identify with this off the top of your head. This is a, 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 the example here is in the, uh, the Auckland War Memorial Museum where wonderfully they catalogue this as not merely the Russell boomerang grenade but the Australian Russell boomerang grenade just to make it clear which country's fault it was. Actually the only one I've seen is in the Infantry Museum for the Australian Army uh, in New South Wales in the Hunter Valley. It's a wonderful museum, if you ever get a chance to go there. The, the way you justify going there is the Hunter Valley is a beautiful wine growing area, lots of vineyards around it, but I thoroughly recommend a visit. But I think those are the only two examples left. Uh, but the Russell boomerang grenade for me is the standout example of any military object where during the design process, after the suggestion of, what about a boomerang grenade? Someone in the room should have the moral courage to say, no, no, that's a stupid idea. And that's the basis on which we're going to look at my bottom five tanks today. Now, number five on my bottom five list of stinkers today is the Vickers Independent. Now, this one you can see is a bit of a harsh choice for a bottom five tanks, because it's not all bad. In fact, there's some really good things about this tank. The designer of this tank, for instance, is Walter Wilson, and I am a huge fan of Walter Wilson. He's the guy who designs Mother. He's effectively the, the parent of those First World War rhomboid British tanks. And I think he's a bit of an engineering genius. He had a huge track record before the First World War uh, and after the war as well. Wilson is a really good guy if you're wanting to design technology. So he's actually got a good designer. Um, and the, the concept of mobile fortress, which you can see represented on it, it's not completely redundant by the time you hit 1922 when the, when the specifications for this tank are done and mobile fortresses is kind of what those First World War uh, tanks were. 
And there's some actually genuinely clever engineering on this. And Walter Wilson is fantastic. Uh, and some of the ideas kicking around here, this for instance, this is an anti-aircraft gun on a tank being designed in 1922. Yeah, whether you'd hit anything with it is a completely moot point. But you've got an anti-aircraft capability on a tank. Um, down here, we've got um, a hole for a stretcher. Um, now, it might not be terribly encouraging for the crew to have a hole for a stretcher, but the concept's quite clever because one of the big problems on tanks and throughout history has been if you get people inside who are injured, how do you get them out? And you have to kind of haul them out uh, through the top. Um, this is designed so you can push your stretcher in, load the guy onto the stretcher and pull him out. Yeah. It's not a great advertisement for joining a tank crew, but, but it's a clever idea. The suspension's quite a good design on this tank. It drives with a steering wheel. Uh, and, and to be honest, my favorite feature on this tank is at the front, where there are steps built into the tank to help you climb the tank. One of the banes of my life is watching 19-year-olds run to the top of a tank as if it doesn't affect them whatsoever. Um, steps for someone of my age, genuinely helpful. So there's some great stuff on this tank. So why have I included it on my bottom five? Well, there's two key reasons I'm including this tank on my bottom five list today. The first one's an engineering problem. Um, that, that engineers tell me, and I'm a historian, not an engineer, so don't call me out on this. Engineers tell me there's a really important ratio between the length of the track on the ground and the width of the tank. And this tank is too narrow for its length. And what that means is that when it tries to turn a corner, effectively it, try, it tears itself apart. This tank, when it was in mobility trials, uh, kept damaging the rear of the tank whenever they went go around a corner. And not being able to go around corners could be seen in some areas as a bit of a problem. It leaves this tank uh, vulnerable to what I would call the Dalek defense. And the Dalek defense is Daleks downstairs, Go upstairs. Um, this one, tank coming towards you, go round a corner. I and mean, that's too easy as a way of uh, defeating a tank. So the corner problem is kind of fundamental and should have been picked up during that design phase. The second one, and the second key reason, and possibly the most important reason why I'm picking the independent on my bottom five list today is a bit more subjective. And that's that if you ask a seven-year-old to design a tank for you, they either design a Conqueror, the big gun, and nice smooth lines, or they design the Independent. I mean, look at it. You can have too many turrets. And this has got five. And it's not only it's got five turrets. If you want to be inside one of these turrets, you're kind of horribly hunched down, and it's not exactly ergonomically friendly. Um, it, is it really fightable with people looking in so many different directions with limited vision? It's, there's an absurdity about it, which we can see today, that just doesn't resonate anymore. That, and admittedly, the Russians love these things. The Russians copied these to high, high heaven, but that doesn't make it good. And it's so impractical, it's, it's an Ad, reductio ad, ad absurdum of, of a concept of a mobile fortress, that it, it's absolutely nuts. And somebody somewhere during the design process should have said, no, nah, no, nah, that's a stupid idea. And so because the independent was clearly designed by a seven-year-old, that's why it's number five on my bottom five list of tanks today. Now, number four on my bottom five list of tanks today is a vehicle which Stuart Wheeler described to me eloquently the other day as a tank that comes in its own box. It's the Tetrarch. Now, again, they're redeeming features for Tetrarch in a way that they're redeeming features for all the tanks I'm going to be talking about today, apart from one, but we'll come to that later. Um, so uh, the concept of a light tank when this was being designed in uh, 1937 wasn't completely redundant. There are lots of people producing light tanks. It's, it's, it's later on, in particularly 1940, when uh, people realized that light tanks are a good way of getting killed. Um, Actually, there's a variation on the theme even uh, in the 21st century in, uh, in Ukraine of uh, light infantry and light vehicles die in droves. Um, 
So light armour in 1937 is all right. Um, and there's, there's some clever engineering on this tank because engineers like being clever. They want to show that they're a genius. So the, the, the steering mechanism on this, actually the tracks themselves uh, bend rather than breaking one track uh, to, uh, and, and accelerating the other to turn. I don't know what benefit it gives to have a bendy track, but it's got some clever stuff in it. So the concept of light tank is all right. The reason it's on my bottom five tank isn't necessarily the vehicle itself, it's how it's then used. So the Second World War breaks out, uh, there's lots of light tanks around, uh, things like Vickers Mark Sixes get massacred in May 1940. Um, but one of the things that emerges from the beginning of the Second World War is, the, is airborne forces. And the British, uh, like others, develop airborne forces. And someone decides it would be a great idea for our new airborne forces to have some armour support. Um, and uh, these are seen as appropriate vehicles for supporting uh, airborne forces because they're small and light. And by uh, 1943, Sixth Airborne has got a squadron of Tetrarchs. And they spend a lot of time in trials figuring out how you get a tank to support airborne forces. And they do it by using them in Hamel car gliders. And this is the remains of a Hamel car glider around our vehicle here. And they do lots of trials in Hamel cars to figure out how you land them safely. And the trials themselves have a few issues. Um, they, they find that if you don't secure these properly, then it doesn't end well for the pilot of the Hamel car. And actually seven pilots died during the trials, which should have given people a clue about tanks and gliders potentially not mixing very well. But they managed to figure out a system and the tech trucks land in support of Sixth Airborne on D-Day. Now the problem is through this, and the reason I've included it on my bottom five tanks is that the obsession through this whole process is how do you get a tank into a glider? And they seem to completely lose sight of the fact that the purpose of the tank is not to live in a glider. The purpose of the tank is to do something on the ground. And it's on the ground that by 1944, these are a complete waste of time because Six Airborne on D-Day finds itself in the path of 21st Panzer, which is a formidable fighting outfit. And if these had been encountering the German tanks, they'd have lasted minutes. They didn't actually encounter 21st Panzer very heavily on the basis that most of the, uh, the Tetrarchs were immobilized because they'd had parachute cord tangled all over their tracks, which is not very helpful when you're trying to get vehicles into action. But this concept of taking a vehicle for a purpose that's already redundant and losing sight of what you're trying to do should have stimulated somebody in that process to say, no, nah, no, nah, that's a stupid idea. And because they lost sight of the fact that ultimately a tank needs to do something on the ground rather than something in the air, the Tetrarch is number four on my bottom five list today. Number three on my bottom five list of tanks today is Valiant. Now, when your tank is used as a teaching aid to tell others about how not to design a tank, you can probably reasonably conclude that the design process really didn't go as well as you may have hoped it would. And Valiant is an absolute howler. When I said earlier, that most of the tanks I'm going to look at today have got some redeeming features, but there's one exception. This is it. It is a stinker of a tank. Um, it's designed, the design starts about 1943, and it's meant to be um, an infantry support vehicle, so it's not meant to be speedy. It's meant to carry a decent sized gun, which probably explains the somewhat deformed looking turret. 
but pretty much everything that could go wrong in designing this is going wrong. And the thing to focus in on for me here is the 1943 bit. Because by 1943, tank design and tank warfare is getting pretty mature. So the Tigers on the battlefield, the T-34 has been around for quite a long time, Sherman's a mature design, which makes this one even worse. And there's just nothing good about it. The, the, uh, it failed its uh, uh, trials for mobility after about 13 kilometers at most of driving. And the things that they were picking up in the, in the testing on this were um, that you couldn't change gear properly. And first gear would jam. Uh, the, uh, you couldn't get your foot properly onto the brake. Uh, the pedal arrangement was designed to uh, trap your feet so you couldn't get out. Um, the drive had real problems trying to get, for instance, get his head out of the turret. It's almost designed to hurt you. Um, and if you think about this tank, one of the things I was pondering this the other day, this tank appears in quite a lot of video games and video game uh, designers in tanks uh, pride themselves on authenticity but if you're going to have the Valiant authentically in your video game then if you're using the mouse it should trap your fingers, if you're using a keyboard it should probably electrocute you, somehow the game should try and physically harm you if the Valiant is to be portrayed authentically, although well, apparently video games physically harming the user are somewhat frowned on nowadays. But because it is not merely a howler, but it's a howler that's designed at a point where people should know better. It's designed by people who should have known better. Vickers, for heaven's sake, are involved in the design of this tank. This is one of the most mature tank designers in the world. And to produce something this bad, during the design process, somebody, somewhere, must have said, no, no. That's rubbish. And because they didn't, Valiant is number three on my bottom five list today. Now number two on my bottom five list of howlers today is the FV4005, which is a tank that doesn't even have a proper name really, but we here normally call it the Big Gun Scent. Now the background to this tank is at the end of the Second World War, the British relationship with the Soviets and the Western relationship with the Soviets gets a bit tense. And it, the situation doesn't help very much by the fact that the Soviets have got these enormous tanks and things like JS-2 and JS-3, to which there isn't really a Western counter. So there's this race to design a British tank with a great big gun. And looking at it, I think I can confidently say that the design process starts with a visit to the pub. And in the pub, they obviously have a discussion of how big do you think we can go with the gun? And that results in a tank with this enormous 183mm gun on it, in a turret that I can only describe as uh, an anti-tank gunner's dream. Now the, the original part of the tank we've got here is actually the turret and the gun. The, the, the chassis is a, is a, is a, is a more uh, modern century. It's designed for a century chassis but a Mark III. Uh, this is a, a more recent one but it looks the part. Um, but when this went for gunnery trials, uh, officially what happened is they fire 150 shots uh, from this gun and the results are what they called generally satisfactory, which I think is something of a euphemism. But here at the Tank Museum, uh, our last serving Second World War veteran uh, was a chap called Harold. His nickname was Spud, which is uh, on the side of this tank, uh, is his nickname Spud, because he was involved in test firing this tank. And his account is when they test fired this tank, the day he was there, they were meant to fire several shots. And the first shot they fired was firing the gun straight forward. And when they fired it, the whole of the front of the tank lifted from the ground. And their second shot was meant to be over the side of the tank, but they figured actually, no, no, I don't think we're gonna do this. So for this tank, the FV4005, because it was clearly the result of a conversation in a pub, and the following morning, rather than saying, yeah, the following morning, someone should have said, tell you what, no, no, 
that's a stupid idea. I'm putting this, the FV4005, as number two on my bottom five list of tanks. Now, number one on my bottom five list of tanks today was going to be the Australian Sentinel. But this is a family show, and when I explained to my wife why I was picking the Sentinel, she told me I was being rather vulgar. And she's Australian and therefore clearly an expert on such things. So I'm standing in this spot for a very good reason, but I'm not allowed to tell you why. But what I'm going to say is, Australia, you had one chance to design a tank. One chance. And you let the school down, you let the class down, and most of all, you let yourself down. And you should be ashamed of yourselves. But I know you're not. But because of that, I'm not allowed to have this as my number one pick at all, so I'm going to have to make another choice. Now, having had to rule out the Sentinel as my top pick on today's bottom five list, I've had to come up with another choice which illustrates beyond doubt that sometimes there really is such a thing as a bad idea. And I know what some of you watching this today are thinking. You're thinking, Richard, all of your choices today have been British. What about the Germans? They can be awful. Well, you'll be pleased to know that my top pick today in today's bottom five list of tanks is indeed a German tank and I'm picking the mouse because if there was ever a tank which illustrates the idea that sometimes you can have a really stupid idea that should never have come to be the mouse takes the biscuit. Now we do have, of course have a minor problem in that we don't actually have a mouse in the collection. In Bobbing, there's only one left which is kind of two spliced together and that's sitting in the in the Russian tank museum in Kapinka. What we do have here in Bovington is some fantastic archival material. So we have things like this album here is a comprehensive album of the, the trials that take place at Burblington. I've probably said that the wrong way. I'm sure our German readers will correct me. This is a blow by blow account, of the vehicle being tried, tri trialed. And um, here I've got the British Army report about Mouse that was written in uh, May 1945. So right at the end of the Second World War when these people are accessible and you can find out what's going on. And this is a wonderful treasure trove of information about something which really is one of the worst tanks ever. And if I'm going to pick out a single feature on Mouse which makes it an absolute stinker, it's its gargantuan nature. This is a tank which weighs in at 188 tonnes. Now that's five and a half Shermans, or essentially a bungalow. And so you've got to think of a mouse, not so much as a tank, so much as a building on tracks. And if you think about the implications of this, you know, officially the tank can go on a train. It's, it's designed to be just, I mean, and properly just, we're talking within you know, small numbers of millimetres, just fit on a rail car. But you'd have to hope that the enemy were at the station because otherwise you've got some real problems. So for instance, if the enemy is on the other side of a river, you know, the, even the Germans recognise the fact you can't get this thing over a bridge. They design it with a snorkel to be able to go under a river up to 46 feet deep. Now just think about that. That's a lot of water above you. And the bottom of a riverbed, sometimes a little bit boggy, one of the things the photos here showing that mouse and boggy ground, not a good blend. And of course, if you want to come out of the river, you've got to go up the bank on the other side. There is no chance when it comes to this thing. It's ridiculous. Now, it's got a lot of firepower. It's got the, the same 128mm gun uh, that a Yagtag had. It's, it's even got a 75mm coax on it, which, again, it's a, it's a level of absurdity, which is nuts. Because it's got a 75mm coax, but they really struggled to get something like a machine gun it. Uh, Ferdinand Porsche, who was the designer, had a real blind spot on machine guns. He, he didn't do it with elephant either. He's, and Porsche generally, one of the reports actually we've got here is about Porsche's approach to tank design. And it's actually a litany of failure when it comes to tank design. He's, he, to design. He's not nearly as good at designing tanks as he, think he thinks he is. Now, the thing's got officially it's got eight inch armour, which is, is quite impressive but it also makes it practically impossible to manufacture. The, the process of making these things went on for years as they tried to get these gigantic slabs of metal to fit next to each other. 
And, and the project takes an enormous amount of time. It balloons in weight. And it's, it's a disaster zone. The reason I picked that as number one is that you know, clearly someone in this process should have said, stop, this is a stupid idea. But in Nazi Germany, saying stop, this is stupid to the wrong person would get you shot. And because the Germans have a system that something like mouse did not get stopped, I am taking mouse as my choice of a project that comprehensively proves that sometimes there is such a thing as a bad idea. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my bottom five tanks today. Personally, I feel I've got quite a lot of my chest, so I feel better for it. Um, if you have enjoyed it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, support us on Patreon. Your help and support is enormously appreciated.